Hello and welcome to another episode of Clark Talks About Things and Stuff. Today, we are going to be celebrating the 200 subscriber special a couple, like, a week late because, honestly, this video was a long time coming. And it's really interesting to actually see that it took me, like, almost an entire year to actually reach 100 subscribers. And now it's taken me about five months, so that's pretty cool. And I did the math. If this kind of exponential growth keeps happening, then I should probably reach a million subscribers by the end of the year. And because of how exponential growth works, it, I'll then reach every single person on the planet, and then people that don't exist, and then just a singularity. That, that's what it'll turn into, obviously. Like, it's so interesting to see the fact that I've actually hit 50 subscribers four times now. <laughs> that's amazing. And even so, remember the 100 subscriber special? I'm honestly kind of amazed that I was able to actually break through on that list and make it really outdated. Of course, also for the fact that, you know, a 10,000 viewed video was going to become a 200, like 40,000 viewed video. You know, something I totally expected. <laughs> totally expected that, especially when my usual videos get like 17 max. But, like, you know what? Whatever. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate you for liking, subscribing, all that kind of stuff. To think that I'm actually worthy of a subscription is honestly very uh, flattering to see, to be honest. And, well, I'm happy to make these videos for you guys. But, but enough talk. talk! How about you? So, the last one was pretty narcissistic, all things considered. I think we already know that. So, what if I did the opposite of a narcissistic subscriber special? What if I did something that would actually probably make me lose subscriber instead? Granted, that's probably going to happen anyway, but like, you know, let's exp expedite the process, I guess. <laughs> Unpopular opinions are amazing, ain't they? It's just so interesting to see how your favorite content creators or just random people think about stuff and what they also consider to be, you know, unconventional, if you know. Now, if you know my Twitter or basically just me at all, you are going to be very interested in this video because let's just say, while I'm not a hipster, I have some very interesting opinions when it comes to video games. And of course, a problem with a lot of these videos is people being all like, hey guys, this is my top 10 unpopular opinions. Number three, I'm a Paper Mario fan. It's just like, okay, yeah, that's arguable, but like, that's not really an unpopular opinion. It's still a good franchise. Paper Mario 64 is really good. My point is, is that I kind of want to make this a little spicier, especially because you know, I'm celebrating 200 people actually liking my content enough to subscribe, of course. So, I think we should get right into it. So, I only have two rules for this list. One of them is that I have to split this list in half, okay? Five things I like, five things I dislike. I feel like that this list could be a lot of disliking shit, so let's at least just keep it even, okay? And of course, the second and probably most important rule is that I don't want this video to be like a drag and like, you know, bring in like real world complex issues. So I'm not going to mention any like religious, political, sexual, medical kinds of uh, opinions, okay? Because, well, A, I'm not really like licensed to give any of that shit. And secondly, I want this video to be fun, okay? I want it to be about little inconsequential shit and I just want to have, you know, fun doing it. Not being all like, oh, I hate how America's turning out or whatever, okay? Granted, you could probably find uh, my opinion on those particular if you were to search my Twitter, so I guess it's a mute point, but like, otherwise, I think that this is going to be interesting. So, let's finally get into it. Thank you all for 200 subscribers. This is losing 200 subscribers with one video. Number five. Okay, okay, okay. I don't think it's going to happen again. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Skylanders is... Okay, I think we get it at this point. Okay, so Skylanders is a franchise that I like. If you did not know this about me, then... I'm going to be honest here, you must be very new, which, considering a lot of my recent growth, um, yeah. Anyways, hi, my name is Clark, I talk about things and stuff, and this is the reason until why I'm never going to get laid. There, I did your Discord moderator joke for you. The thing is, though, is that saying that you like Skylanders really isn't that bold of a stance, especially considering the fact that 
you know, it was still a pretty popular thing back in the 2010s, whether you liked it or not. And, well, I need to tell you a bit of a quick story. Once upon a time ago, there was a sweet little innocent company for the purposes of the story named Activision. They were an amazing company and they were just scouring, looking for what kind of company could actually make an adult Spyro reboot. They were just wondering. Until, from the depths of hell, came up Toys for Bob. They grabbed Spyro out of their quick little hands, and they said to themselves, Yes! How about we ruin this franchise by making it a complete and total Toys to Life disaster? <laughs> now, of course, you might be saying, Clark, that was kind of pointless, and also, that's not really how that went down. Well, apparently, some Spyro fans think that's exactly how it went down, judging by the reaction that keeps getting brought up when it comes to Skylanders. And if you're a Skylanders fan, it's really not that much of a surprise to dunk on these kind of Spyro fans. But you want to know what this list entry actually is? I like both. I like Skylanders and I like your little classic Spyro games, right? Skylanders really doesn't use that many, like, Spyro elements. They mainly only do, like, the floating island thing, along with just having Spyro, Sparks, and Cinder there. Along with, you know, Cinder's dad, but he's really relegated to the comics and doesn't really make any appearances in the actual games. Skylanders really isn't trying to reinvent Spyro into a new and bold direction. It's more so just Spyro is a guest character in Skylanders. Whoa. That's how I kind of cope with it, and that's also how a lot of these other Spyro fans really should cope with it, because, again, there's really nothing here that damages Spyro when it comes to, like, Spyro's characterization or anything. He's just another Skylander. And yeah, is that annoying when the first game is literally called Spyro's Adventure? Yes, this is why it's at the number 5 spot, because while I like Skylanders, it does have some problems, especially with this argument. First off, a lot of people really rag on Spyro's design, but I don't really see that, particularly with the first couple games. If we're talking about, like, I don't know, Superchargers Forward, then yeah, no, I completely agree. For some reason, Vicarious Vision saw it be a fun idea to update the character designs, and uh, yeah, no, he looks like six times worse than he actually does, so that's amazing. And don't even get me fucking started on his cutscene model and Imaginators. Holy shit. Oh yeah, and how could I forget that Imaginators not only existed to promote itself, but also to promote the Netflix series, which, let's be honest here, sucks. I really hate that Netflix series, especially season 3, where the whole joke with Dark Spyro is, Oh man, is Spyro acting evil? Oh, nope, nope, must have been the wind! And that's literally all the jokes up until Spyro and Dark Spyro finally freaking split each other. Also, kind of the problem of, you know, making him the main character. That kind of doesn't help the whole, like, it's a Skylanders thing, not a Spyro thing. Just even further. But thankfully, this was at a point where it's just like people didn't give a shit. Well, as much as of a shit. I do think it is kind of elitist to say, Oh, those original Spyro games are so good, and meanwhile, the Skylanders games are fucking awful. Spyro really was a PlayStation mascot. Keyword being PlayStation. Not everyone owns one. Hell, for a long time, all I played was on Nintendo. Until, like, 2021, where I switched over to Xbox. So I've never really had, a, like, a current PlayStation console. And neither have I actually bought any of the actual classic Spyro games, as in the original PS1 versions. And it was also because of this retro gamer elitism that I was thinking about legitimately buying the classic Spyro games for, like, the PS1. But... Thankfully, something came to my aid. Really, the whole nail in the coffin to this whole debate is Spyro Reignited. If you know me, you know I like Spyro Reignited. It's legitimately one of my favorite games of all time. And guess what? Toys for Bob made that game. Yeah, same people who made Skylanders made an actual Spyro reboot. And again, the game's pretty solid. I say it's pretty well, and everyone seems to be pretty happy with it. So, saying that, like, Skylanders ruined everything is kind of a weird statement, especially with, again, Reignited being out. So yeah, while Skylanders isn't perfect, and really neither are the actual Spyro games, I still will say that I like both of them. It's kind of like the Mario and Luigi franchise versus the actual Mario games. Where it's like, yeah, this is an RPG spin-off versus the actual, like, 3D platforming games. 
that's kind of how I see it, and I don't know how many others see it like that way. And besides, we have a common enemy here. Both Skylander fans and Spyro fans have one common enemy. Crash Bandicoot. Seriously, Toys for Bob, can you please stop making Crash Bandicoot games for fucking five minutes and just make Spyro 4? Or at least give us something Spyro the Dragon related like you've done for Crash. Like, holy hell, can you just, like, stop making him a cameo in every goddamn Crash game and, like, actually let him exist, okay? Can you let Spyro actually do stuff? I know you had an entire series to do Spyro stuff, but, like, goddamn it, just... Just do something other than Crash Bandicoot for five minutes, okay? <sighs> okay, moving on. Number five. Lego and I really go way back. I used to be a really huge Lego kid as, well, a kid. It is probably going to be one of those things I follow, like, religiously until the day I die. And hey, I probably wouldn't have gotten very interested in video games if it weren't for the Lego games on the DS. So yeah, that's where everything went wrong. But seriously though, I really, really like the LEGO games. Sadly, I didn't have a console for a while. I got a Wii essentially when the Wii U was coming out, so yeah. Hell, sometimes when we went to LEGO Land, I used to actually go into like the little video game area they used to have, and I just used to play a lot of the LEGO games on like the 360 and stuff. What I'm getting at here is that I'm a pretty old LEGO fan at this point, which are called a fouls, by the way. So I remember the days onto LEGO games being a small little hub world where you'd have like 15 or so levels to play through, and then you collect everything, congratulations, here's your 100%. But there's something that changed, specifically with LEGO Batman 2. This change completely has just destroyed my relationship with LEGO games, and I have not purchased one since. Well, okay, it's not that dramatic, but you want to know what it is? It's the fact that Mumble Talk doesn't exist. Nah, I'm just kidding. Well, kind of. I mean, it's definitely a better way of delivering stuff, and it's more interesting for licensed products, and it's... Just, you know, way better for, like, language to people trying to, like, you know, get language development and all that stuff. But, like, you know, I'll fuck all that shit, okay? That's not the problem with these games. The real problem with games that are from LEGO Batman 2 forward is something I like to refer to as cities. Mostly, they're the giant open world areas of every single LEGO game. And I just want to quickly show you something. This image is basically every LEGO game that I have yet to actually 100%. Notice a trend with this image? Yeah, that's right. It's way too many superhero games. And also for the fact that, you know, outside of Complete Saga and Star Wars 2, pretty much all these games have giant cities in them. Sometimes multiple. Now, of course, this has not prevented me from actually buying any of these LEGO games. As I've already shown, I pretty much own all of the Traveler's Tales LEGO games. But the thing is, is that they are just so annoying to 100% complete is what I'm trying to get at here. Now, of course, games like City Undercover would be, like, really weird if they just went with the original LEGO formula. But, like... I don't know, man. I just think I'd rather have the original style back where most of the game is the levels and not the hub world. Take the Skywalker Saga, for instance. When you begin episode one, you have to go through negotiations. All right, cool, whatever. You know, it'd be nice to see how this level actually plays out in a more modern LEGO game. It's in the hub world. And then after you get off the tr uh, trade ship and go to the boo, guess what? That also is another open world section and not a level, even though Complete Saga, we've already gone through two levels by this point. And then we go to the Gungan, like, uh, underwater area, where, again, this is a cutscene in Complete Saga, basically, like, five seconds, where, like, they hypnotize Boss Nast or whatever. And then the first level of the actual game is a boss fight against this giant fish. So we've practically already blasted through like two major important points that have already been levels in the original Complete Saga. Now I'm not saying they need to retread over everything the exact same uh, moments of the movie needed to be the exact same levels or whatever, but like starting off with negotiations, like starting off on the first level, that would be really cool, okay? That'd be really cool to re-experience and could even be nostalgic to people, but no, it's in the hub world. Yay. 
Oh, and you want to know what's even better? You cannot replay these open world sections. So if you have something in like, I don't know, like the middle areas or God forbid, like the third uh, movie of your selected trilogy in that game. Well, I guess too bad for you. You have to play through the entire game all over again. But it doesn't really matter considering the fact that most of the open world section is run from this part of the map to the other and then run back and go back and forth until you finally enter a level. That's basically the open world sections in Skywalker Saga without going into detail about like all the other missions and stuff you can do in them. Now, of course, in Complete Saga, it really doesn't matter all too much, but in a game like City Undercover where the first level takes like two hours to get to, yeah, that's not good. To my knowledge, the only game in the entirety of the Traveler's Tales LEGO game catalog that actually, like, allows you to replay, like, the open world sections is, like, Lego Ninjago movie game. So, like, yeah, that's kind of it. Mostly because, like, the levels and the hub world are combined into one in that game, which, I mean, I guess if you were wanting to do that, then sure. But, like, yeah, no. Not to also mention the fact that, like, games like Complete Saga, like, had 160-something gold bricks. Lego Star Wars 2, it had, like, 99. And that was with a bunch of different modes. That was for getting in a multitude of different ways. The Lego games nowadays just have way too many freaking collectibles. Specifically, gold bricks. Gold bricks are just nothing outside of just, like, a, com a thing to collect. And the most egregious part about these gold bricks is that there's way too many of them. Like, for instance, Lego Movie 2 has 500 cosmic bricks to find. Five freaking hundred. That is way too many for a game that crap. Oh, you want to know something even worse? The Skywalker Saga has over 1,000 kyber bricks. Like, that is ludicrous, okay? No matter what video game, unless you're getting it in mass like the studs, that is a ludicrous amount of collectibles. Sure, you get multiple for certain missions or, like, you know, the Kyber Comets and all that stuff, but, like, it's still ludicrous just how much there is. Again, LEGO City Undercover, it has, like, 400 gold bricks. It is so, so much. Reminder that back in the early, like, Complete Saga, like, Star Wars 2, you could actually unlock, like, certain levels at, like, a certain total brick count. Most of the stuff that you, uh, do with those gold bricks nowadays is mostly, like, build some stud fountain or something at some point in the world. So, yeah, I don't know how many people are gonna push back on this, but honestly, it's just really, really annoying, is all I'm gonna say. Number four. Oh boy, guys, look, it's Clark complaining about Ubisoft for, like, what, the, like, seventh time at this point? Much like EA and Activision, Ubisoft is one of those video game studios that just keep pumping out crap after crap after crap. Along with really stupid and greedy video game practices like hiding out where all the collectibles are on the map for like a dollar. Or making a $15 DLC have one freaking achievement in it and not even be able to alphabetize their games correctly. Ubisoft is really stupid, and no, I will not consider them the creators of those South Park games, because those games were actually good. Plus, Stick of Truth was also made by Obsidian, Ubisoft published it, even though that they also own Obsidian. My point being, it's not an Ubisoft game. And it really is annoying, okay? It's always annoying when you got these large-ass companies grab on to, the, like, those three niches that they always make, and yet they just don't make anything else that's actually worth a damn. They mainly want to focus on assassin open world games, pop music simulator 2,900 trillion, even though the Wii is dead, and the slightly more tolerable minions, but only when Mario is around, because otherwise the game is mid. Thought I mentioned uh, I never played Sparks of Hope and I never played the demo either. I just played Kingdom Battle and my god is that game average. The point is though, is that Ubisoft have made two games that I consider some of my favorites of all time, but they just don't want to do anything either with them or anything in the style of them. The first one I'll mention is Rayman Legends. Like, we all are asking for it, we all know it. It's kind of a basic bitch take, but like seriously, we want more Rayman. We want him in Smash. We want Rayman 4. We want a new goddamn 3D Rayman game. Seriously, how long has it been since the last fucking Rayman 3? 
How long has it been since Hoodlum Havoc? Like, holy shit. Not only that, Rayman Legends is a Wii U launch title. And even so, this game has never gotten another sequel. The most egregious part about this is that Rayman is your mascot, yet you want to focus on literally anything else, which is so annoying, yet you still want to keep throwing him in there like the Assassin's Creed games or whatever, some kind of bullshit-ass Easter egg. Now, we already know about that game, but here's another game I want to throw at you, Child of Light. The basic gist for people who've probably never played this game. You play as a princess known as Aurora, stuck in the world of Lumeria, and you need to find a way to get home. The game is turn-based, and honestly, it is a very creative use of turn-based uh, combat. It is probably some of the best turn-based combat that I've experienced in, like, ever, okay? It is so damn good, and the visuals are so nice, the music is absolutely fucking lootly phenomenal and let's t finally talk about the graphics the graphics for this game and rayman legends which is why i decided to lump the two together was made with a thing known as ubi art what the hell is ubi art i have no clue but do i love it yes do i know what kind of other games that this art thing has been in no do i want it in more ubisoft games hell yes if it is this detailed in both child of light and rayman legends for child of light being a slightly more serious story and then rayman legends being goofy ass motherfucking bullshit i mean like come on dude i definitely want to see more of this all right i want to see more of it hey guys while i was editing this part about ubi art um, I came to the Wikipedia article to look at it some more, and I found something very, very interesting. So, remember how I said I wanted it to be in more games? Well, shock of all shockers, they were in more games. But, here's the deal. Yeah, <laughs> they were in the Just Dance games! Like, you're joking, right? You come up with something that amazing, and you use it for freaking Just Dance! You, you're, you're fucking joking! And yeah, there are a couple more, like, unsavorable games, such as, like, a, some random Gravity Falls game, and, like, a couple of the Rayman, like, mobile games, um, along with some random Yokai Watch dancing game for some reason. But, like, you... That's the ma modern appearances of Ubi Art, is that they use it for fucking Just Dance. Use it for a Rayman Legend sequel, God! I think that we just need more Rayman, okay? We definitely do. Child of Light, I'm a little bit more hesitant on because, you know, the game's story was good as is. I, it kind of left off on a cliffhanger, kind of, if you really want to look at it that way. But I still would uh, either appreciate a good Child of Light sequel or no sequel for it. I just want more people to recognize how good uh, Child of Light is, is all I'm going to say. But no, apparently we need to have more Assassin Open World games. We need to have Pop Music Simulator 970 trillion, now for the Nintendo fucking GX. And of course, Minions, but nine times less marketable. And no, I don't care that the Rabbids are technically a Rayman enemy as a substitute for actually making another Rayman game, okay? I want Rayman. End of story. I don't want your fucking rabid shit. Ugh, number four. So, I'm someone who doesn't play a whole lot of multiplayer games. This is because, well, first off, I have no friends. And secondly, because, honestly, the competitiveness gets to me, and when I start to screw up, I just feel bad about myself, man. I just feel like, why am I still doing this? I just... <laughs> I just feel so empty inside. Especially when it comes to stupid shit like Smash Brothers, where there's a lot of randomness in that game. Especially if you have, like, the items turned on. And it's just like, oh, okay, I spent, like, so many hours grinding on the CPUs trying to get better. But nah, someone just got fucking Kyogre and pushed me off the stage. Really appreciate it. All this to basically say, I don't understand why people pay for online in video games. Like, you buy an entire $60 multiplayer exclusive game, and then, well, then what? After your goddamn subscription ends, what happens next? You have to buy some more for, like, the fourth of the price that you already paid to play the game in the first place. Like, what's the point? This isn't including DLC, either. Like, I don't understand why you would play, like, a first-person shooter game that is, like, infinitely better on PC. I'll give that route there right now. It's way easier to aim than on a goddamn right stick. And why you would ever think that it is okay to pay for, like, $15 
to just play online. It is so ridiculous. And the only uh, like one that doesn't do that is like Steam and other PC storefronts. It is so annoying. Like, I don't get it. Does, like, the game that has the online multiplayer have to ask Microsoft to borrow servers or, like, use server space or, like... I don't know how the hell this crap works. And, of course, we can't get through this discussion without talking about Switch Online. Bro, Switch Online is fucking garbage because every Nintendo console up until the Switch has had free online, okay? It wasn't perfect. It was kind of crap, honestly, but when you really get down to it, it was free, okay? I get it, servers aren't free and all that, but like, it was really annoying for them just in 2018 to announce, hey, by the way, we're just going to add a pay-for subscription service so you can actually play online. And the sad part is, is that I really did think that when Smash Brothers, when Pokemon came onto the scene, people would be fucking livid and just would boycott the whole thing and be all like, no, you've given us free internet for years now, and now you're starting to take it away. Apparently I have uh, too high expectations for people, I guess. I don't know. People blissfully buy that crap for some reason. Oh, but it's not just for that, though. Oh, no, 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 no. It's also to play NES games and SNES games and uh, Game Boy games. And that's kind of it. Unless you buy the $50 expansion for a goddamn uh, subscription service where you uh, get an N64 emulator and a freaking GBA emulator. Like, GBA games are incredibly easy to fucking pirate, okay? I'm gonna put that out right there. It is so easy to try and run GBA games and regular Game Boy games. So, like, why would you add it to the fucking, like... To the expansion pass, why would you do that? And let's be honest here, does anyone give a shit about the Sega Genesis one? Oh, but that's not it, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> no, they have to add even more onto the $50 pass because, let's be honest here, it's already a pretty shit value because now you got DLC for games you probably don't even own. That's basically what they're doing here. They got Octo Expansion, they got uh, Mario Kart, they got, like, fucking Animal Crossing... It's just so weird. Why would you do this? Now, of course, that's not to say that Xbox and PlayStation are really doing that much better. But, like, when it comes to, like, the value of it, it gets kind of ridiculous at times. And it also makes you forget that you bought this thing originally just so you could play on goddamn line. For instance, Xbox has an entire section in the store dedicated to certain discounts if you have Xbox Gold. And up until around October 2022, you were able to have free Xbox 360 games with just an Xbox Gold subscription. So it was already kind of ridiculous. Granted, most of the games that were available were multiplayer ones outside of like Super Meat Boy. But even so, man, it is still you getting a free Xbox 360 game. And the last one that they uh, gave you was Portal 2, so like, I don't know, man. Not only that, Game Pass subscribers, like, get more Microsoft points. They can do cloud playing. And, oh yeah, I almost forgot, Game Pass Ultimate allows you to play entire fucking games without buying them. All for a subscription fee. Again, you kind of forget that this is supposed to be for, like, online. So, like, yeah. Really, the only way that these kinds of services, like, actually feel worth it is if they have all these weird little bonuses that barely pertain to actually, like, just playing the fucking game online. And again, all these bonuses. What if you don't want those? What if you just want to play online? Too bad, I guess. And I can't compliment, like, I can't talk about PlayStation because I have no fucking clue. Okay, to put this in perspective, just so we can be clear here, imagine you're playing Among Us on your mobile device. It's a free version of Among Us, like, an actu like the actual version of the game. And then you go on Steam, you buy it for five bucks. Okay, you can play with your friends now online and you won't get plastered with ads like in the mobile version. Alright, cool. You, die, you buy it for the console, and then you have to pay three times the amount a month, for Xbox anyway, in order to even just play the game in the first place. And people are fine with this? Which is, like, again, the weirdest part. Again, $60 game, you're paying, like, like a quarter of that price just to play online. <sighs> just play on PC is all I'm gonna say about that, I guess. Number three. 
you know, I've heard a lot good from the Thousand Year Door, so I might as well pick up a copy. Oh, oh, oh my god. Okay, yeah, no, never mind. Okay, well, uh, how about Pokemon Rumble? Yeah, that sounds like a great time. I mean, the game looks fantastic. I might as well go and buy it right now, and, and I can't. Okay, yeah, um, alright then. Hmm, okay, well, what about screw video games? Uh, let's to TV, yes. Favorite TV show, Cannon's Worst Driver. What can I do to watch that show? Oh, only watch it on YouTube. Well, okay, is there like a DVD or something I could buy? No? <sighs> All right, well, that's it, I guess. I guess I'm gonna have to talk about this. So, basically, copyright is stupid, and here's the reasons on to lie. I specifically handpicked these four because of just how obnoxious they are, really. Again, The Thousand Year Door is a widely celebrated game. Tons of Paper Mario clones have been spin off from it, and so many people love it. But the prices it goes for nowadays are like a little bit insane for just one game, okay? So, huh, why as well just go and pirate it, right? Well, apparently if I do that, then I'm breaking the law and I'm such a badass and uh, you're so horrible. But like, first off, if I'm buying the game off of eBay, the money goes to eBay and the seller, not the original company that produced it. Secondly, this is a 20-year-old game, or nearly 20-year-old game. Like, how the hell am I supposed to get this, like, from a store or something, at like an actual reasonable price, and not pay some incredibly jacked up horse crap? Same thing for Pokemon Rumble. In fact, actually, on online stores like eBay, you can't sell electronics with software as the main reason on to why you would buy that. So, either I gamble with a bunch of Wii's, or I download it from the store. And since the store is closed and I have no actual way of accessing it, then, so shocker, I'm going to grab an ISO file from the internet and download it to my Wii. Or just play it on my computer, why not? In fact, actually, playing on my computer is honestly better, especially from my position, where I take screenshots from pretty much everything I play, okay? So, in that sense of the word, unless I make up, unless I buy like a Wii capture card, then I will obviously <laughs> get it on the PC. As for Canada's worst driver, well, let me cross off a country that I don't live in, that being Canada. So, that means that even though that I live right next to the goddamn country, guess what? I can't see any of that shit because of reasons of some kind of like area code or whatever. I don't know, it's so stupid. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if the show was like from some unknown like publisher or whatever, but like the publisher for the show is Discovery, yes. That Discovery, HBO Max Discovery, oh sorry, it's just Max now, sorry I forgot. But anyways, yeah, they don't have Canada's Worst Driver on Discovery Plus regardless. Or even if like I got a VPN and I went and I changed my location to Canada, which well I probably shouldn't have to do, um, even that's the case, I still can't actually see it because they don't really put it on the streaming service. So, you want to know how I watch the series? on YouTube, and according to YouTube's guidelines, and if Discovery finds out that all of the episodes are on YouTube, there goes the entire goddamn series that I love so much. And I can't just download every episode. There's like 145 minute videos. How the hell is, I, I'm not supposed to like download this. So, okay, what about other official means? Like, I don't know, DVDs. This show came out in like 2005. So, of course, there's got to be some kinds of DVDs here. The answer is no. There are no DVDs for one I could find on eBay, on Amazon, nothing. I could find absolutely nothing about this kind of shit. Which, again, considering the fact that the show came out in 2005, it's especially weird, okay? And it's especially weird that, again, I live right next to that country of origin, and yet they go down, and I guess it's an embargo or something. Like, it's a completely illegal to have Canada's Worst Driver DVDs in fucking America. Like, that is so stupid, man. That is just so stupid. So yes, I do promote the piracy of these particular works of media because otherwise, you really have a hard time actually trying to experience these. And the thing is, is that I do want to support the original people, okay? I am not heartless, okay? If there's like Mario Odyssey or something, like I'm not gonna pirate that, but for a 20-year-old game that hasn't seen a single re-release, a game that was completely shut from the goddamn store, 
and just a show that not only am I not allowed to watch on like a streaming service, but also cannot find a single DVD for, that is just pathetic. Like, copyright is one thing, okay? This kind of weird stranglehold is another, okay? It is just so obnoxious. And I just wanna, I just wanna experience it, okay? Right? Is that too much to ask for? Is it? I don't know. Let's just move on. Ugh, number three. Computer generated imagery, more commonly known as CGI, that for movies is a pretty useful tool, but even so, I feel like that is just overplayed at this point. Now, again, I understand that you need to have a giant green man in your movie, and you need to have that giant green man, like, attack someone in a costume. So, what's the only way to do that? Well, with CG, that's kind of it. The problem is, is that it looks just... It looks so just unbelievably fake, man. And the, like a ton of movies, you see like a CGI creature and the guys are all like, oh my gosh, guys, hold back. The computer generated imagery is coming out right for us. Nine times out of 10, CGI just doesn't look real in like actual movies. And it's just depressing, okay? For a movie like The Jungle Book, it is incredibly depressing to see a movie set like this. It's also incredibly annoying for movies like Lion King 2019 to exist in the first place just to show off. Hey guys, look, we're able to make our CG animals look really good. Wow, and like you sacrificed, what, the story, the visuals, um, the expressiveness of the characters. You uh, basically required all the songs to be cut out from like Kakuna Matata uh, and all for just showing hyper-realistic CGI animals. Go fuck yourself, Disney. The best part is, is that in video games, this kind of hyper-realism is incredibly detrimental and very annoying. Yes, it is incredibly vital that we need to see every piece of grass get singed in a game about a purple dragon. Yes, it's incredibly important that we see all of the pus spores from a guy named Glup Shido. Yes, of course, that kind of attention to detail is nice and all, but one thing that these AAA developers forget is that this is a video game and not a movie, okay? You can have kind of meh looking graphics and still have the game be fun, okay? I remember there was something going around on Twitter like a little bit ago and it was basically all like oh we made this game with embroidery oh we made this game with wood carvings and of course we also have cuphead and their uh hand-drawn graphics now cuphead in my opinion it looks amazing it has an amazing soundtrack but the game is not fun to play so that's kind of the problem with a game like the graphics and all yes can make an experience okay shit graphics does take you out of the world and blah 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 but like companies are gonna try so hard to polish their shit and like it is so obnoxious to see this kind of hyper realism in your face kind of horse crap when really the game is about killing vampires i don't think you need to make it like the most realistic thing in the world okay that's how Illumination and Coco Melon became so damn profitable, along with appealing to the lowest common denominator, meaning toddlers. But still, again, for a movie to have, like, the most mind-blowing, oh my god, this owlbear is totally there kind of moments, fine, sure, you can have it there. But in video games, I feel like it's a lot more egregious, along with also making movies entirely just to show off the friggin' CGI, and then somehow... Even though it's the dumbest piece of shit imaginable, it gets a billion dollars of profit because people are idiots. I mean, general audiences are, okay? And it's just it's just so sad to see that, man. Even though that obviously, you know, I can't control a damn thing about them and it's just me being petty. But, like, even so... <sighs> CG is just so overplayed at this point that, honestly... I could go the rest of my life without seeing it. In fact, that's why I really love all those, like, early uh, CG animated stuff, like Reboot, and, like, those uh, bowling animations. That's why I, re I literally love them, because of the way that they're modeled and all that. I just, I love it. Nowadays, you'll be hard-pressed to find an animation software worth its worth for, like, actually making any of those kinds of animations without deliberately screwing yourself in the process. So, yeah. Number two... For this one, I think I'm just going to cut to the chase here. Minecraft should be considered the best game ever made. Now, as I'm a part of Gen Z, 
obviously this kind of train of thought goes to oh you're just a stupid little idiot baby that doesn't know anything about true video games but like seriously though i think that minecraft has a little bit more merit than ocarina of time i mean when you hear that something is the best game ever made it has a kind of reputation to try and keep so i have bought this game i have played this game i have watched people play this game and I just don't get it, okay? This game is not good, not in the slightest. I mean, the game starts off with a grinding mission in order to get a shield so that you can actually, you know, play the first dungeon. I mean, give the other Zelda games credit. They've had way better intros than Ocarina ever had. Like, fucking A Link to the Past. That game had an amazing intro with you storming the castle, getting the story from your uncle, and rescuing Zelda. Meanwhile, again, in Ocarina, you sit through some really long cutscenes, you go outside, and then you just grind for rupees. And then you also, you know, go and get the uh, Kokiri sword, so like, nah. Even when you enter the Elder Deku Tree and start in the first dungeon, it's just not interesting, man. Like, even uh, Link's Awakening had a more interesting first uh, dungeon with the Rock's Feather. Oh, and don't even get me started on how to access the second dungeon, because it is a long and annoying process for practically no reason. In my opinion, the most infuriating part about this is that you have to go to the Lost Woods to get Saria's song, so that then you can sing the song to Darunia, and then he gives you access to the Dongo's Cavern. Like, that is just so stupid and harebrained. Like, you basically leave Saria to never see her again at the very beginning of the game, only to then come back and be all like, Hey, can you tell me, can you teach me your song? I kind of forgot it. Oh yeah, and the dungeon that it unlocks? Yeah, no, that's where I completely gave up. It was just so uninteresting it was just so unfun and that dungeon has a lot of moments that are just annoying so of course after playing said game i went to youtube trying to find actual reasons onto why people consider this the best game ever made i have still not really found that at all except i guess if you're talking about like shafrillis and other people saying oh but the story is so amazing yeah you know what this is right this is a video game okay if i wanted to see a story like this then i'd watch a story like this i wouldn't play a game to experience this stupid story all right I mean, even so, the game is more so just like a coming-of-age story about like, oh, your childhood, uh, you look back at it so fondly, you never realize that it's good you have it until it's gone and all, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. Honestly, I think I hear more positive about Majora's Mask than I do hear about like Ocarina of Time. And while I don't really side with Brental Floss on a lot of different issues, I do side with him on the Ocarina of Time song. I feel like it perfectly encapsulates my feelings and also how I look at other people onto like just how they experience this game. This makes my eyeball sore. 3D was done so well in Mario 64. Again, I didn't say the song was perfect. I was just saying that comparatively to like anyone actually trying to convince me that Ocarina of Time is the best game ever made. Yeah, no, he makes a pretty good points. I don't know why it gives you such a boner. Cha cha cha. I mean, yeah, sure, that was cringy, but like, again, I have no clue onto why people consider this the best game ever made. So, like, I don't know what he says there is true. Regardless, Minecraft, I feel like, again, deserves this title just that little bit more. Now, let me make this perfectly clear. I do not enjoy Minecraft as much as other people do, okay? I find it to be just an okay game. The game is alright. It's just a game that I don't particularly care about at all. It's a game that I get bored with really fast, but even so, it makes more sense to me that Minecraft deserves this title just from the fact of, again, people really loving this game. Like, when was the last time you saw anyone, like, give an entire cartoon episode or two based on Ocarina of Time. You've never seen that, absolutely never. But for Minecraft, they've done that twice. I don't know why they did that twice, but they did. But even so, it makes more sense. There are so many people online that have given like endless amounts of praise to Minecraft and have done so much with the game, okay? Either by modding or SMP stuff, or like actual like, you know, real 
vanilla playthroughs and all that some like multiplayer shenanigans it's like one of those like it's a trending game and all but it's one of those trending games that doesn't really go out of style unlike games like five nights so i don't know man i feel like it deserves it a little bit more in short minecraft doesn't have a water temple and doesn't have a tutorial fairy that goes hey listen every five minutes so automatically the game is just better anyway Ugh, number two Ugh. Okay, so trust me when I say there's a lot to talk about here, so I'm going to try and keep it as concise as possible. Video's already long enough as is, anyway. Five Nights at Freddy's was one of those franchises I never really experienced, like, actually playing the games until more recently, mainly because, well, I didn't have a computer for one, and, well, I didn't have a console to actually play those games on because they didn't exist on console yet, and, well... I just didn't care because it was a jump scare horror game and I was too scared to play them. <laughs> but now, of course, I'm toughened up and I still can't really play any of these games without being paranoid. So, you know, that's fun. However, you don't need me to tell you that the death mini games in Five Nights at Freddy's 2 were incredibly popular and interesting ways to actually explore the lore of the franchise. And then FNAF 3 decided to overabuse the shit out of them. And made them basically required in order to get the good ending. And it's a fucking can of worms. And I'm not excited to do that. And then FNAF 4 decided to be extra annoying. And then give us too many games every goddamn in between nights. Hey, remember when the first game was like incredibly focused on like, hey, here's night one, here, here's night two. Not, okay, you finished night one, here's a fun with plush trap, here's the lore based mini game, here's night two. Like, it's just so ludicrous, okay? <laughs> it's just so ludicrous, man. And the future entries of this franchise aren't safe from it either because of Sister Location being just... Ugh! It's just not a good game. And really, to say anything about it would just be me parroting what, like, fucking uh, yeah said about the game. Because legitimately, I was thinking about making a Sister Location video until he made it and he has more credential than me. And again, I would have just said the same damn thing as he said. So, like, yeah, I'm not making a video on Sister Location. And then, of course, we have Pizzeria Simulator, where the game begins on a useless mini game that never appears in the game ever again. And, of course, a whole pizzeria building thing that, like, let's be honest here, who the fuck cares? The point is, is that a lot of the mini games in this franchise have been getting more and more just stupid, really. And now we unceremoniously talk about FNAF World. Mostly regarded as a failure, I actually still really love FNAF World. Of course, this isn't Final Dragon Hearts Traveler 972.35, but like, it's still a nice little fun RPG in a series that is well, horror-based. Do I think the game had some really stupid moments? Yes. Mainly, you know, Scott releasing the game for 15 bucks and the game turning out like this originally. Like, come on, dude. But the point is, is that I like FNAF World in the series that has a shitload of minigames. Thankfully, the base game outside of the clock endings didn't really have that many minigames. So what the fuck am I complaining about? I'm complaining about Update 2. Yeah, I think there's a reason onto why I'm considering this my number two entry on this list, because I legitimately don't know how many people have either A, played this section of the game, or B, actually think it's bad. Well, for starters, this entire thing is minigame based. And it is so obnoxious. Your reward for beating each of these minigames is a certain character, but most minigames have an alternate objective you can complete in order to get more characters. There are four minigames, one of them only has one character, one of them only has three, and the other two have two characters. To say that Freddy in Space and Chica's Magic Rainbow are the worst of the four is a complete understatement, okay? Because Freddy in Space not only has three characters, you have to beat them with either no upgrades, some upgrades, or all the upgrades. And of course, all upgrades is the easiest, but like... Mm, it's not fun to do. And then, you got Chica's Magic Rainbow, which, if you know anything about Scott, you know how just annoying some of these games are to play. Scott made a rage game, and, uh, yeah, no, it's not fun. Plus, your reward for finishing it normally is Scott Cawthon, you know, Amadude. But, if you beat it in three minutes or less, you get a worse character with Chipper. Cool. 
The other two games are really stupid. Uh, mainly Foxy out EXE, where you just hold right, and then that's it. That's kind of it. I mean, that's all the EXE games are anyway, but, like, still. And Foxy Fighters is so stupid. Take the plane levels from Cuphead, uh, and that's it. Just make them way easier. And not only are they easier, they're also uh, really stupid, because in order to get an A rank to get the other character, you have to... Uh, kill all the enemies, you have to not get hit, you have to take no power-ups, and you have to do it as fast as possible. I did that multiple times, and I still didn't get the alternate character. So that's fun. And hey, at the end of it all, you got to experience probably the worst area in the entire game. Because not only is it one of those dark cave areas, every time you enter a fight, your HP goes down rapidly. Which no other battle in the entire game has this kind of special condition crap. So, it's just throwing in a new mechanic at the very end of the game. So, that's really fun. Oh, and what attack you need to do in order to actually block it? You need to use Bubble Breath, which does literally nothing else. So, thank you. Thank you for including an attack that literally does nothing else outside of just blocking the one thing you decide to make a status condition in these areas. Ah! Oh, and let's not forget about the final boss. The final boss is Chica's Magic Rainbow. And, guess what they do? They stand there, menacingly, doing nothing for three minutes. Until, like, about halfway through or so, they then start spawning mini versions of themselves, and then they deal 999 damage. So that's really cool. Thank you. So not only do you need to manage your bubble breaths, you also need to use three certain attacks. You need to use Mega Virus, Iron, uh, Neon Wall 2, or Fourth Wall. Either of those kill uh, any of the little, like, these little mini rainbows that the boss continually spawns. Your best bet onto getting rid of these things constantly is to use Mega Virus, because it basically just kills them instantly. But yeah, either way, you kill Magic Rainbow, you get your ending, blah blah blah, that's cool and all. But you want to know what's the worst part about this? This is a game called FNAF World, where in the game, you could just completely skip the world, because if you go finish the mini games, you get all these ridiculously overpowered characters that do hundreds upon thousands of damage, and can basically one-shot a final boss and Chipper's Revenge with a 10% guarantee. Like... Wow, that is so stupid, and the fact that you can get this at the very beginning of the game is just what makes me pissed off, okay? But play these really unfun minigames that completely suck, and to just, and then just completely steamroll throughout the entire game is just so, so lame, man. It is just so lame. Also, by the way, in order to unlock all the characters for Fixed Party, you have to get the fan bite at least once. This includes the Halloween characters. So yeah, it's not fun, basically. And uh, yeah, I just don't like it because it has to do with a bunch of bullshit minigames. There's way too many new mechanics. And just, you could access it from the beginning of the game and just steamroll everything. It's not cool, man. It's not cool. Now, of course, it wouldn't be a top 10 list if we didn't have any honorable mentions. And trust me, there are a lot. There are a lot of explosive opinions that I could shout. And of course, a lot of them have to be hateful. So... Here's just a couple. But first, I have to subtly plug my other videos. Because, obviously, videos like the Hollow Knight one, the one where I talked about the Sonic song and the Pokemon spin-off videos, they don't deserve to be mentioned in this video because, well, I already talked about them. And while it is very lame to not hear any kind of, like, updated opinions or whatever, and just someone saying, just go watch the older videos if you want to know my opinion... I'm not going to repeat them here, is all I'm going to say. Video would be way too long at that point. In fact, it already is. So, the first actual honorable mention is blocking in video games. Now, blocking is just so stupid in video games, man. I hate it so much. Now, of course, the problem with this and the reason why it's not on this list is because it's a personal thing. I am very, like, offensive when it comes to playing video games. I don't waste my time with any, like, grab button or a fucking shield button. In Smash, I just fucking attack. I don't use, uh, I don't use my shield, I don't use grabs. That shit's boring, okay? I like getting hit. And then, uh, also getting hit and not just blocking everything and then just, you know, setting me up for death. Yay! And one thing that I especially hate about blocking are super blocks. Pfft, 
friggin' pussy. All he needed to do was just block at the right time, and then he would have been completely fine. He would have been protected from damage, he would have been protected from effects of attacks, he would have had an up, uh, a leg up on his opponent while they're still in their attack animation. It's super blocks are stupid, okay? Blocking in video game in general is just stupid. I played a game known as Dems Fighting Herds, and I was playing the arcade mode. I was playing the second highest difficulty, and, you know, the CPU was kind of beating me to a pulp. And I was thinking, God, if this is what it's like on the second easiest difficulty, what is it like on the insane difficulty? All it was was just the enemy blocking. I was just continuing to attack 500 million different attacks, and they were just like block, 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 instant block, 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 and then it was over. And then the match completely ran out the timer, and it was won by decision. Huh? Why? Oh, God. Up next, we have the Nintendo Switch, just in general. Now, granted, there are a lot of positives about the Switch. It basically refreshed a lot of franchises that were definitely growing stale thanks to the Wii, the Wii U, all that stuff. But the thing is, is that just Nintendo games have just gotten so undercooked. Online service is just yuck, is all I'm going to say about that. And just... Again, the games are just feeling way more underbaked. Like games like uh, Wii Nintendo Switch Sports. Like, why does that game exist? Like One Two Switch. It's a sixty dollars Switch game where all you do is milk a cow. As one of the eighteen different mini games. Whoa! Couldn't package in a new WarioWare title up until like what twenty twenty one or something like that. Nintendo fans are also a pretty decently big reason onto why I given up actually caring about the Nintendo Switch because they just they're just so intense nowadays it's just so it's so unfun to follow stuff now i i swear Ugh. okay uh so the next part on this honorable mention section is indie games over 30 dollars. i don't know if this is just me being cheap or something but like i don't know i just never really liked indie games that are like over 30 dollars and it's just, it's just weird to me, okay? Especially, like, a hat in time. Like, I love you. You're definitely impressive for being an indie game. But, like, I don't know. That price tag just uh, puts me off. Especially if it's, we're talking about all the DLC. Okay, so the next honorable mention is that mini games and role-playing games are freaking horrible. Now, of course, many of the examples that I have are Square Enix games, mainly. Like, yeah, of course, we got FNAF World Update 2, but we already get that. But what about uh, Final Fantasy? So, you got 7, right? And you know what? My favorite part about Final Fantasy 7 is the snowboarding section. It is just so amazing. Oh, Final Fantasy 9. Oh, man, I like that game. You start off, on, like, one of the first gameplay sections is you having to perform, like, a little, like, skit or whatever. And if you don't get a perfect score, then you can't 100% complete the game. Isn't that fun? Oh, what about Final Fantasy 10? Hey, let's make an entire side mode so important in the story, man. And also, let's make it horrible. And just basically underwater soccer. And of course, we can't forget about World of Final Fantasy, which I swear to God, those are the worst fucking mini games I have ever played through. But again, outside of Final Fantasy and FNAF World, I really don't know what I can actually add to this. So, uh, yeah, fuck you, Square Enix. Next up on the honorable mention thing is to mention the fact that I'm a classic Paper Mario fan. This is here because it's a basic bitch take. And I know I made fun of it at the beginning of the video, but... Bro, Mario, Paper Mario 64 is so good, man. Alright, and with that, we're almost done. There's just a couple of ones that I want to talk about. Mainly, achievements. Now, I love getting achievements, but these are the three categories that make me want to pull my goddamn pubes out. First up on the chopping block are speedrun achievements. Dude, I freaking hate these achievements. It doesn't matter how small or large your game is. Having an achievement that's all like, complete the game in two hours! It is just so fucking tacky, okay? Speedrunning is one of those, like, elitist hobbies, okay? Hey, I could beat Ocarina of Time in, like, five minutes. You know, people are interested in this because it's a passion of theirs. Not because an achievement list told them to do so. And again, it's weird because it's like, in a way, it kind of devalues your game. Where it's just all like, hey, you can beat this game in, like, less than an hour. It's like, okay, cool, if I want to go and watch it on YouTube. Not just something I actually want to perform, okay? 
In my opinion, the biggest offenders of this are the Shantae games. Like, I love Shantae. It is a great series. I love it. Why does every single goddamn Shantae have to have a speedrun 100% achievement? I have no clue. I don't get why you want me to do that, Fade Forward. Like, goddamn it. It also doesn't work the other way, where you have an achievement for logging in a certain amount of hours into a game. Bro, I can put in as many or as few hours as I can. Go screw yourself. The next up on the chopping block are the discontinued achievements, as in some kind of online service went down or some other general mayhem. Now I understand in a way it does devalue the achievement, but I'd rather have all the achievements actually be attainable rather than just gated by the passage of time through like some kind of dead online service or something. Oh, you decided not to play the game back in 2016 when you were still a Nintendo fan and didn't own an Xbox? Well, too bad you can't get all the achievements for this game. Just screw off. And of course, the most obnoxious one of all, forced multiplayer. Like, it's one thing if I want to go and do multiplayer by myself. It's another thing that I need to go and do this. And it also sucks because, again, every single console requires you buy a subscription in order to even access the online in the first place. And you're telling me that I have to spend $15 a month to watch my ass get handed to me by some guy who has played way too much of, like, Injustice 2. Cool, yeah, because I wanted to try and grind for some random bullshit achievement that it's like, win five times online or something like that. Now, I understand that with games like Butterfly and Castle Formers existing on online storefronts and just being way, way too easy and just getting a crap ton of gamer score with certain games, I understand that some achievements don't feel like achievements anymore. But, like, those achievements, man, those are the worst offenders. Regardless, that's the end of the honorable mention section. It took way too long to finish, but, hey... We made it through, and now it's time to talk about the number one, both thing I like and both thing I don't like. Oh boy, here we go. Number one. If you follow my Twitter, you may or may not know about this argument that I'm about to propose, because any time that I talk about this, I feel like I'm a broken record. But hey, you know what? At least I can actually put it on a YouTube video now. First off, let me get this out of the way, World of Final Fantasy is one of my favorite Pokemon games. And no, that's not like a joke or anything, it legitimately is one of my favorite monster collector games. The characters that are not named Lawn are amazing, the music, just like Child of Light, is freaking phenomenal. And of course, this was the Final Fantasy game that made me a Final Fantasy fan in the first place. Now of course, is the game perfect? No, I already talked about how atrocious those fucking mini games are but otherwise again i really love this game i even played it when i was in hawaii and i enjoyed that more than hawaii so if that's not saying something i don't know what does anyways i played it it was an amazing game i bought it two more times once on steam once on my xbox and i'm almost done with that xbox version but one day i was looking up world of final fantasy stuff and then I found this article. Now, of course, at first, that sounds absolutely amazing. Until I look at the timestamp of when the article was written. And, of course, to know that one of your favorite games of all time has their script written about five years ago now, and them just not wanting to, like, do anything with it, oh, that's just amazing now, isn't it? It's especially fun when you look down at the article and they say, uh, the Switch port basically had no budget behind it, so that was really cool. Square Enix really cared about this project. But more importantly, it states right here, if Square Enix gives us its approval, we can start development right away. Well, apparently they didn't have any hope in this project. They really didn't, didn't they? They have completely thrown this game come under the rug and completely forgotten about it. Now, of course, you have people out there saying, Clark, Melee Melo is the sequel to World of Final Fantasy. Here's the reason onto why that's not really the case. For the base game, sure, that is kind of it. That is technically the sequel. But the thing is, is that Maxima came out around 2018-ish. 
and Maxima actually added in a whole bunch of Mirages exclusive to Melee Melo. Plus, that game is a Japanese exclusive gotcha game. So if that was the case, I'd be really pissed. But thanks to uh, Maxima's existence, I don't really know if that's actually the case. Plus, Maxima does have an exclusive ending to it. And not only that, I'm not going to spoil what it is. It's one of those games that you really have to go in blind if you actually want to, you know, enjoy it. So, really, I recommend not searching it up. But let, let rest assured, that sequel bait is enormous especially when we don't get fat chocobo in this game okay in white chocobo's entry you can't get him but maybe sometime next time <laughs> Now, despite the fact that typically this game isn't received negatively, per se, I would say I am probably one of the only people that actually do want a sequel to World of Final Fantasy. But not only knowing that the story of the sequel to one of my favorite games of all time is already written and just shelved by the parent company, nah, there's some extra stuff here that I just am really disliking. For instance, Forspoken. Now, Forspoken is a completely huge can of worms that I can't just squeeze in right here. Just letting you know, dialogue's not interesting, the gameplay doesn't look fun, and again, this is a game that Square Enix thought would sell more and be way more interested in funding. Let's talk about another game that they thought would be a huge hit. Oh, do I even need to count the ways about Balan Wonderworld? Because yes, it is a game that they made. It is a game where they're all like, hey, did you know that like you have to put story in this? Like, a, like too much story in this? You know, it's a Square Enix property, you know? And then Yuji was like, Wait, I have to put what in this video game? I put the story? What the fuck? What? Uh-huh. And not only that, everyone complains about there being, like, four buttons to jump and all that. And, like, all the face buttons are jump. There are actually six. This includes right and left trigger. Which is just so surprising to me. How do you have six buttons do the exact same thing? But remember, World of Final Fantasy 2? Not profitable. Pull on Wonderworld? Throw all our money at it. Oh, and not only that, even if there was a sequel that actually is in development and all that crap, I probably wouldn't be able to play it anyway, considering the fact that they have such a stigma against Xbox for whatever reason. Seriously, Octopath, Live a Live, the fucking Pixel Remasters, Final Fantasy VII Remake, all of those not on Xbox. The fucking hell, Square Enix. Well, at least we have Steam, I guess. In short, we can't have World of Final Fantasy 2 because it's potentially not profitable enough or not as profitable as NFT gaming. Now, of course, am I saying that this script is absolutely perfect, needs no changing whatsoever? No. I mean, some of those ideas that you've written down could probably be really outdated, especially to the modern video game landscape. But hey, let me throw an idea out there for free. This definitely will sound weird at first, but honestly... World of Dragon Quest. Why not? How about we have, like, almost all the Square Enix franchise have their own World of game? That'd be so cool to see. Especially because, you know, Dragon's Quest already has the slightly more cartoony monsters. So, I think that would actually be pretty perfect to have Lauded Rain go through a crap ton of, like, the Square Enix franchises. And yes, this even includes Forspoken, if you really want to put it that far. But hey, maybe the reason unto why they haven't made a new World of Final Fantasy game is because they need to replenish their stock of Final Fantasy characters. Because, well, World of Final Fantasy did technically use characters from all corners of the Final Fantasy franchise. Even though, like, some games like Final Fantasy 2 and 15 only had, like, one character associated. But, like... Still, I guess. I don't know. Just please make World of Final Fantasy 2, make it good, and make it before I die, please. Is that really too much to ask for? Maybe, but like, still, please. I'm begging you here. Oh my fucking god, okay. Number one. Oh god. Well, here we are. The very last part of this video. <sighs> This is going to be my most cancelable offense, because you never hear anyone hate on this as much as I'm going to. So, what exactly is it? <sighs> the Legend of Zelda is probably one of the most overrated franchises in gaming history. Hi, editor here again, just to let you know that this segment was recorded before anyone actually had their chance to play Tears of the Kingdom, so... Yeah. Now, of course, when I talked about Minecraft, like, 
I don't know, 20 minutes ago now. Basically, I said that Ocarina of Time doesn't really deserve that position. The game is just not as fun as people really do make it out to be. And again, people's really only, like, thing to defend that game is, it has such an amazing story, which... Again, I hear more positive things about the gameplay, the story, the atmosphere, everything about Majora's Mask, and yet, I don't see that many people put it up as the number one best game of all time, just in general. As much as Ocarina, anyway. Oh, but where else do I begin to talk about this overblown franchise? Let's bring back a point that I mentioned back in the Hollow Knight video. Basically, every single game from the original Legend of Zelda to freaking Skyward Sword has pretty much the exact same, like, gameplay structure. I understand that Mario isn't the most original gaming franchise under the sun, but at least there is a reason for that, because it is a platformer. Platformers are all kind of the same when you really get down to it, especially 2D platformers. There are only so many ways you can make an enemy get jumped on and grab thousands of coins that be fun. However, in the Zelda franchise, it's not really bound by any kind of, like, real genre outside of, like, what, action-adventure, the probably the most generic fucking tag for a video game, like, ever. But even so... Every single game is structured the exact same way. You go into a dungeon, you get an item, you use that item to defeat the boss, you get a heart piece, you move on with your day. And then you probably never even use that item again unless it's something vital like the bombs or the hook shot or bow and arrow or whatever. And not only do you get some of the same items over and over and over again, sometimes you even get items that are literally the same as other items, and then you just gotta, like, discontinue them, I guess. I don't know. Like, for instance, there are so many Zelda games where you get, a, you get the slingshot. It's like a very early uh, game weapon. And then, near the end of the game, you have the bow and arrow. So, like, what's the point? They even control the exact same way and have basically the same mechanics. It's just that one's a slingshot, other's a bow and arrow. It just takes up room in the inventory. And again, every single Zelda dungeon is the exact same. You go in, you get a bunch of small keys, you grab the items, you grab the, the compass and the map, you go get the item, you go to the boss, you beat him up with that item that you literally just obtained, and then you get the super important item and that's it. Oh, and this repetition is not only exclusive to the dungeons. It is 100% the same goddamn story every single time. Let me summarize a typical Zelda plot. Once upon a time, there was Farm Boy McGee, and he was so important and special, except not really, he was just another ordinary person. But, there was something special, someone special and extraordinary. The good princess of goodness and light, and evil, and really cool, and heart, and amazing, and light, and coolness, and she was just the greatest thing to ever happen since sliced bread. But then, oh no! Evil McDemon Dark Guy decided to come down and evilly steal the demonized Lily, steal, like, the Princess of Light and all that. And oh no, Farm Boy McGee now needs to go through, like, eight or so dungeons or whatever. And then they need to go and fight Mr. Evil Demon Darkness Man. It is rescue the goodness of Princess of Heart and Light, and everything is all good in the end. And Zelda and Link then have violent sex for the rest of eternity. There, I just predicted literally the next. I don't know, Infinity Zelda game plots. And trust me, even for something like Breath of the Wild, that is essentially the plot of the game. Link needs to go rescue Zelda from Ganon, who's taken over Hyrule Castle. And just like in so many other games. <laughs> Not just that, this franchise is horribly gimmicky. Like, it is amazing just how gimmicky some of these titles are. For instance, in Wind Waker, you unlock the King of Red Lions in order to, like, just traverse the sea entirely. It only takes about two hours to actually get to that point, though, so, you know, it's fun. And besides, there's not really a whole lot in the sea. Let me correct that. There's a not a whole lot that's, like, on the surface. There's not really a whole lot. It's mostly just a bunch of water. That's all the sea is, obviously. So, it's just annoying to explore, really, even with the fast sail. Link teams up with Midna in Twilight Princess to become a dog and do dog stuff, I guess. And then, in Phantom Hourglass, you guessed it, you get to sail the open seas 
all over again. Oh yeah, you also have a really gimmicky dungeon that you have to run through constantly, and every boss just gives you like a little bit more sand so that you can delve deeper and deeper into the Temple of the Ocean King. And it is regarded as one of the worst experiences in any of these Zelda games. Oh, and don't forget about spirit tracks. Yay, trains. In Skyward Sword, you get a bird, and that bird allows you to fly the open sky. Now you might be questioning, Clark, wait a minute, isn't this the same thing as Wind Waker and Phantom Hourglass? Yes it is, it's basically the exact same thing, but instead of in the sea, it's this time in the sky! And again, Tears of the Kingdom is literally just the exact same thing as Breath of the Wild, but like, this time, you now can ride cars! Yay! Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts, hell yeah! Oh, not just that, there's also an entire Sky World that you can now visit. Even though Skyward Sword exists, on the same console. Good job, good job. Reminder that Mario Sunshine not only brought Mario to a completely separate area of the of the entire world, they also decided to change up his movement and options and actually had a platform with a water jetpack. Was it the best game ever in the franchise? No, it's debatable if it actually is good. But the point is, is that it does so much more than any real Zelda game has really done, to be honest with you. You still explore Hyrule, you still get like your normal bullshit, and uh, it's just so ridiculous. And again, even in Mario Galaxy, the game feels so much different from the other platforming genres. The story in the Mario games is so simple because, again, it could be however Bowser actually wants to steal the princess, like I said in the Sonic video. And again, don't forget the fact that these plots where Bowser steals Peach and blah blah blah, those are pretty much side plots in the RPG games. Pretty much all of them, basically. Oh yeah, and as for originality, just looking at the franchise, The Legend of Zelda is 100% that kind of medieval fantasy kind of stuff that you see everywhere. Like I said with my summary, it is so incredibly generic. You have Evil McWizard Man, you have the Light Princess of Goodness, and just random farm boy McGee becomes an epic super badass hero. Like, that's literally... Every goddamn story. Every single one of them. And like, and people say Mario's plots are generic. Like, come on. And of course I feel alone in saying this. Pretty much every single YouTuber, gaming YouTuber especially, that is worth their gall has 100% said that Zelda is a really good franchise. It is the number one thing to ever exist in the history of anything ever. Even people like Shafrillis, again, has said that Ocarina of Time is the best thing ever happened since sliced bread. Which is definitely not the case. Because again, just because a game's story is good doesn't mean the game is good. And guess what? The game isn't good! Oh, and let's quickly talk about those remakes, why not? Now, to be fair, the Wii U ones aren't really that bad. The Switch ones, on the other hand, are abhorrent! So, first off, what was one of the first games to release on the Game Boy NSO bullshit? That's right, Link's Awakening. You know what thought it would be a good idea like a couple years ago? They decided to make a Link's Awakening remake! Why? $60 for uh, this bullshit? Why? Why does this exist, man? I just don't understand. The only real difference is that you can bump trees and you can get apples. Ye motherfucking ha! Definitely worth a $60 price tag. Oh yeah, and let's also not forget about the fact that they got rid of the photo booth thing for Dampy's, like, amiibo dungeons. Which, again... You have to use Amiibo, and to my knowledge, Zelda is one of those only franchises that still use Amiibo. Especially because of, again, fucking Skyward Sword HD. That game decided, hey, let's lock one of the only differences from the original Wii version. Let's just lock it out with an Amiibo. <laughs> it's a $30 Amiibo, and everyone still is okay with this? And then, of course, when I did probably the worst things and stuff video, I, of course they had to end it off with Tears of the Kingdom being all like, Hey guys, guess what? We got another amiibo! They sell you fucking hell!
feel like I'm losing my mind, so I'm just gonna conclude this right here. Basically, the Zelda franchise is just not worth it, okay? It's literally the same game over and over and over and over again. Doesn't matter if it's 2D, doesn't matter if it's 3D, it's the same game over again. Even Breath of the Wild really isn't that much different from the other Zelda games. Sure, all it really lacks is just less of the story that is just completely annoying for more gameplay, but that's kind of it, really, man. That's kind of it. And in my opinion, none of these games are really worth the title of the best thing ever made. At best, they're average. <sighs> Alright, so that's basically it. And, well, I guess to just kind of shorten this conclusion. In conclusion, the CIA are after my head now because of this video's release. But yeah, I ran out of things and stuff to talk about. Thank you again for 200 subscribers. And, well, I ran out of things and stuff to talk about. Subscribe if you want. Thank you all for watching this video to the very end. And I'll see you all next time when I have more things and stuff to talk about. Oh my god, an entire hour worth, jeez.